In this video, we're going to look at an introduction to natural or free convection. Natural convection is that fluid motion that is due to temperature differences in the fluid that give rise to the, to the fluid motion, which in turn affects our heat transfer between a solid body and a moving fluid. So to look at the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, where we've made several assumptions, the assumptions of a steady flow, an incompressible flow with constant properties, a Newtonian fluid, and we've neglected viscous dissipation in the energy equation, and of course conversion of other forms of energy to thermal energy. Well, to study natural convection, we need to relax one of these assumptions, and that assumption is uh, that of our body forces due to density differences in the flow, or gravity forces. And so if we have a fluid where there are temperature differences, so the main flow is at a temperature t infinity, and there's some portion of the flow that has a different temperature, of course we're going to give, get ri give rise to a net force, the difference between the buoyancy and the weight of that region of fluid, which is going to be given by that change in density relative to the background fluid times g, and of course we've divided every term here by rho, so we have a delta rho over rho times our acceleration due to gravity and the component in the x and y direction. But the way I've drawn it here, I only have a y component, but for general purposes we'll leave it in there. Now, we need to think about a material property in order to expand this term and get a, a set of s equations that we can solve. That material property is the volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion. This is relating the density change in a fluid to a temperature change. So it relates the change in density with respect to temperature at a constant pressure. If we think about this expression, we can come up with an approximation of it that the change in density, rho infinity minus rho, is equal to rho beta t minus t infinity. Now, the, the difference in these two temperatures, rho infinity minus rho versus t minus 2 infinity, is arising because of this negative that appears here. And of course, for most fluids, if we increase the temperature, we're going to decrease the density, and that's why we see this inverse uh, behavior here. There are some exceptions, I'll talk about that a little bit further on, but for most fluids, virtually all fluids, an increase in temperature results in a decrease in the density. And so this is a way of writing our delta rho, rho 2 minus rho 1, or rho infinity minus rho, being equal to t rho beta t minus t infinity. So that's our density of our background fluid, which we're going to assume to be constant, and these are the changes that we experience because of those temperature differences in the flow. And for an ideal gas, we can simply evaluate beta as 1 over t, where we express t in absolute units. This is a thermodynamic property, a thermodynamic definition, and we must use absolute units when we evaluate beta. If we don't have an ideal gas, this is a material property that we're going to have to look up. Okay, so we can now replace our expression for our delta rho over rho from the expression that we just saw. Delta rho over rho is equal to this beta, the coefficient of volumetric thermal expansion, times t minus t infinity. So we can substitute that in for both of these terms. And now we have an expression that's going to give rise to a force in the fluid because of these temperature differences, or the buoyancy force in the flow. Now earlier, before we added this term, we had a system where because we were assuming everything had constant properties, we could solve the hydrodynamics separately. And later, solve the energy equation using the U and V that we solved from the hydrodynamic solution. With this approximation, which is called the Boussinesq appro approximation, we can no longer do that. Now we need to know the temperature solution in order to calculate these buoyancy forces, and therefore we need to solve all four of these equations simultaneously, which can give us much more of a challenge. Also realize that this is an approximation, this is a simplification. And this simplification is of course related to the change in density being approximately equal to this uh, expression on this side. And so if delta rho becomes large with respect to rho, or the changes in density are very large with respect to rho, then we can no longer use these simplifications where the only term that we've allowed, th allowed this to change is in this term here. If those density changes are large, we'll have to go back to a previous form of these equations before we pull the density out of our divergence operators and all that. Uh, but for the purposes of this course, we're going to assume that this Boussinesq approximation is perfectly valid and carry on. What I'd like to do now is think about the implications of natural convection, or free convection, the implications of having these net buoyancy forces acting on parts of our fluid, and what that will do to our solutions. So let's consider first a vertical flat plate, so whenever we're talking about natural convection, it becomes critical to lay out the direction of gravity. And let's say we have a plate where the surface temperature is greater than the, the temperature around here. Well, what's going to happen is the fluid is going to get heated by this surface. Because it gets heated, it's going to become less dense. Hot air rises, as most fluids, as I said, as the temperature increases, 
the density becomes smaller, and therefore we're going to have a net force acting on this fluid wanting to carry it against gravity, or in the upwards direction in this example. And that means that we're going to get the development of a boundary layer type flow, except that the driving force is not the forced convection that we put over it, but instead these buoyancy forces. And that makes for a little bit of a difference, but we're going to get the development of a boundary there, and outside this boundary there, we're going to have the velocity is equal to u infinity is equal to zero, and we're going to have the temperature is equal to t infinity. And so if we draw a velocity profile in red, we're going to have the no-slip condition on the wall, we're going to reach some maximum, and we're going to go away to zero here. And so this will be our local velocity distribution, and similarly if we drew a temperature distribution, we would see that we're going to go from some higher temperature at the surface of the plate and approach t infinity far away. And so we'll have something that behaves rather like a boundary there, with this distinction that the velocity at the edge of the boundary there is approaching the free stream velocity as it was before, except now that free stream velocity away from the plate is equal to zero, and this motion is completely arising because of these temperature differences, because of these body forces resulting from those density differences, and that's why we call it natural convection. But of course, we'll have a developing velocity profile across here, a developing temperature profile. We'll have a heat transfer coefficient that is higher at the leading edge and decreasing as we move away from that. And we'll find, of course, that the total heat transfer due to natural convection, or the convection coefficients due to natural convection, are smaller in general than that which we find in forced convection. Let's think of some more geometries. Let's imagine that we have a box, and we have the temperature on the top surface of our box, and again, we have to draw gravity so that I can say the top surface is greater than the temperature at the bottom of our box, thinking about the fluid inside this box. Now, if the temperature at the top of this box is higher, that means that my density is going to be lower. And that means that I will have my lowest density fluid up here, and my highest density fluid up here. And so what's going to tend to happen is that we'll have a nice stratification of the flow where we have no motion at all, but we have this continuous decrease in density with the lighter fluid sitting on top of the heavier fluid. And what does that mean? There'll be no fluid motion, and this will be a conduction problem only. We'll have conduction from the surface to the surface. If, on the other hand, we look at the situation where the density, the temperature at the top surface is lower than the temperature at the, at the bottom surface, now we're going to have a situation where these buoyancy forces are going to be arising inside the fluid. We will have the lightest fluid on the bottom and the heaviest fluid on the top. And that means that there's a driving force for this lighter fluid to move upwards in this flow, and we'll expect that we'll get movement in here and we'll probably have these roll cells form uh, where we have row 2 is greater than row 1, so the fluid that is cooled by this top surface will become heavier and want to sink back down, where it's heated by the lower surface and will want to rise, and we'll tend to find that we'll get a number of these roll cells, and it will change depending on the size of this, how many of these roll cells will fit inside this box, and of course it changes with the driving force. So we have the Rayleigh number, which represents nearly the buoyancy forces relative to the viscous forces. The viscous forces are resisting this motion, whereas the buoyancy forces are driving this motion. And so the larger the temperature difference between T1 and T2, the larger are these velocities going to be, and the higher is the heat transfer rates between the wall at T1 and the wall at T2. We will find, in fact, that there are probably three flow regimes here. If the temperature difference is very small, the buoyancy forces, forces won't be large enough to overcome the viscous forces, and we'll find that there will be no fluid motion and we'll have a conduction problem only. At some point, as this temperature difference increases, the buoyancy forces will be large enough to overcome the viscous forces, we'll start to get this motion uh, to occur, and it will be a nice a laminar motion and a laminar flow, and as we increase the temperature difference even greater and the buoyancy force gets even larger, we may see a transition to turbulence in here, and all of those regimes will see different amounts of heat transfer. The turbulent flow, much like in our other cases, will result in more mixing and a more effective transfer of heat from this surface to this surface, as well as, of course, the fact that the buoyancy force itself is larger, so these velocities are larger in addition. Now we could turn this sideways and think about our windows. Again, 
Notice that gravity is labeled here. It must be for these problems. If we have a hot side on the inside of our house and we have a double pane window here and a cold side here, in the past we've considered that there was pure conduction and this air provided a very good resistance. Now, of course, what's going to happen is that the fluid is going to be heated along this side and we'll get a motion across here as the fluid is heating, much like our flat plate that was hotter than the ambient, except now it's going to hit this top wall. It's going to be forced to move over here and it's going to be cooled down on the cold side and move across here. And so we'll get this motion that appears like this. And you may know in the cold uh, winter day, there's some interesting patterns of condensation on your window. And perhaps there's something inside the window which obstructs the flow. And you can see that in the condensation patterns on the surface of the window. But effectively, we're going to get natural convection driving the flow in the circular motion, rising up the hot side and coming down the cool side picking up heat on this side and transferring it to this side and passing it uh, to the cold side over here. And so the more, the stronger these are, the bigger the temperature difference between these two sides, the larger this motion is going to be, and the more heat we're going to lose through there, especially if we have the pure conduction case. And we can calculate the Nusselt number, getting the right correlation for an enclosure like this. And if that Nusselt number is equal to 1, think about it and work through the problem, that means that there's no motion and it's a pure conduction problem. Nusselt number is equal to h length scale over k. And if that's equal to 1, my convection coefficient is equal to k over l. If this is my l, this is the inverse of the conduction resistance. So if my Nusselt number is equal to 1, I find that my convection coefficient is exactly that which I get from conduction. And if my Nusselt number is greater than 1, then I have higher heat transfer because of this motion. Now sometimes people put blinds inside the windows. These are representing the blinds, which we can open and close inside the windows. So let's imagine a situation where we have the same window as before, except we have blinds in it, and they're fully open. If that's the case, I'm going to get the fluid heated across here, rising because it's heated on the hot side, it's going to come across this blind and move over to the cold side, and it's going to de then experience a higher density as it cools down, and I'll get this motion across here. Now, if we think about the case where we had no blinds, this fluid is moving all the way up this plate and it's getting hotter and hotter. That means it's getting closer and closer to this hot temperature far away from the window, and the rate of heat transfer is decreasing as we go higher up on this window. If we put blinds in order to obstruct the flow, we have a greater heat transfer over this portion because the fluid hasn't heated up so much. And then we bring it directly across and we pass that heat through the cold side out to the outdoors. And the same, the same situation occurs. We have a greater heat transfer because the temperature differences are much smaller across this small section. Once we get into our next section, we have the cold fluid coming from this side directly over here and we have much higher heat transfer rates because we have a colder fluid right here than we would have if this fluid continued all the way up. And that means that putting blinds in the middle like this is going to increase our heat transfer rate from the hot to the cold because we're going to see this effective increase of shortening the distance, which will increase the heat transfer or decrease the temperature difference, the average temperature difference between the fluid inside here and the hot and cold sides. And that tells us very clearly that if we're thinking about an enclosure like this, the aspect ratio is very important. We'll have a different heat transfer if we have no blinds and a very large aspect ratio like this than if we decrease the aspect ratio by putting blinds inside the window. Of course, sometimes we have skylights, or we incline our windows, we incline our enclosures. We're, of course, going to have a similar situation here. The fluid is going to be heated on the hot side, and it's going to want to rise up, and it's going to pass in some circular motion or some cellular motion such as this, enhancing our heat transfer. But of course, the driving force for heat transfer, that buoyancy force, is going to be altered because this temperature difference, or this gravity vector, is now, uh, we now have to look at the components, and we have only a component of this driving this. So we'll see that the convection coefficients are also going to be a function of the angle of our enclosure, as that angle is changing the relative strength of that gravity vector relative to our flow. Now let's imagine instead that we had our enclosure where we're thinking about the heat transfer on the outside of this. Perhaps this is a duct, and the surface of our duct everywhere is at a Ts, which is greater than T infinity. And so if I think about this surface over here, 
I'm going to have something very much like that vertical plate where I have a boundary there occurring and I could calculate a convection coefficient due to this uh, vertical plate on the sides of this thing. Up on the top here, I have a situation where the surface is hotter, so I'm going to be heating the fluid and I'm going to be getting the fluid rising up from the surface. Cooler fluid coming in from T infinity. So I'm going to have an enhanced heat transfer as I cause flow to come off the top of this surface. And if I think about the bottom surface here, now my lowest density is going to be on this bottom surface because Ts is greater than T infinity. And so I may well have a beautiful stratification of the flow here and conduction only on this surface. And so we may well see that all different sides of this have a very different convection coefficient. And you have to think about what's going on in each of those situations to pick the right correlation to determine what is the heat transfer on each of those different sides. We would have different behavior if we have a plate that's heated from above or heated than below. And we can look at many of these different situations and come up with good engineering approximations of the heat transfer from a heated duct like this. Finally, let's consider if our surface was that of a pipe. And maybe that's a pipe carrying a heated fluid, and so the surface of this pipe is hotter than this. Now what we're going to see is that we have a point at the bottom of our surface from which we're going to see the development of boundary layers like on a vertical plate, and it's going to result in a motion as we heat up the fluid across there. It's going to follow the contour of our pipe with a boundary layer type flow, and then we're going to see a plume coming off the top of this. And so we'll have enhanced heat transfer over this, then compared to the cases before where we assumed that we had pure conduction. And of course, if it's windy, if we superimpose a velocity over here, then we have to consider whether this velocity is great enough to completely swamp the buoyancy forces here, and we have a pure forced convection problem, or if it's low enough that it modifies this a little bit and we have a mixed convection problem and we have to account for that mixed convection. The pure natural convection will have a plume coming off the top and we can calculate our Nusselt number for that situation and for many other geometries as well.